are holy. There's none beside thee, not anywhere. Nowhere will there be found anyone who is like you. We come to you this morning in our sinfulness, recognizing that the grace of Jesus is what makes us acceptable to you. And we take hope in that this morning and pray that you would use this time to change our lives, to conform us to your holiness so that we might live the life you've called us to live in our homes and our families. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. What is home? Home is the place where you go when you don't have any place else to go, right? You've been out shopping and eating and every place else is closed down, so you, you go home. Home's also the place where when you go there, they have to take you in. That's our families. And, and we know by experience that families can be a place of tremendous joy and tremendous peace and, and, and fun and life that fulfills us, and at the same time, families can be a place of tremendous brokenness and hurt, and sometimes that's just dinner time. Both sides of it can happen so quickly. In our homes is a place where brokenness is, is often most easily seen because it's the people we live so close to and we're in such close proximity and we're, the, the, the relationships there and, and many times in our homes and our families there's no place to run and hide. In fact, we don't even try to run and hide sometimes from the brokenness in it. We just kind of metaphorically undress ourselves and, and let it all hang out for everyone to see. We let down our guard. Because after all, they're our family, and when we go there, they have to take us in. They have to tolerate us. And sometimes that can create tremendous brokenness in our lives. You see, those things that happen in our families don't just affect us in those four walls of the house, but they reach far outside of that. In fact, sometimes you'll get up in the morning and you will leave the house to go to work you'll get in your car and you'll turn the radio on but it does not sound like anything to you because in your mind you're rehearsing the pains that you're carrying out of the home and it may have been brokenness that you felt for weeks or months or years and you just can't seem to shake it because it's so close to you it's not the life of the family next door that bothers you it's your life it's not the kids next door that bother you except when they're yelling and screaming in the driveway next to you right it's not their family problems that are weighing heavily on you it's yours. And that influence can affect us. In fact, that influence is what we call discipleship. That's what discipleship is. It's influence. It's teaching us to live a certain way. Now, usually we use the term discipleship in church in terms of following Jesus. We're to be disciples of Jesus. In fact, remember, that's our mandate as a church, right? When Jesus was ascending back into heaven, he told his disciples, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Go, therefore, and, and make disciples of all nations. Teach people to follow me. Baptize them and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. And, and sometimes we just associate that with the formal teaching as if I'm standing here teaching you a certain set of facts to know or teaching you a certain set of principles to follow or teaching you certain things to say or do at particular times. And we think of discipleship as this right here. But do you understand that discipleship at its root is influence, teaching people to do something? You see, we're always making disciples of one sort or another. By the way that we act and the things that we say, the ways that we respond, we are teaching those around us to do the same thing. Our underlying theme today is that families are places of discipleship. Families are places where we, as members of that family, are influencing others around us. And our job as followers of Jesus is to use that influence to push those around us closer to Jesus, to push them closer to the gospel, to push them closer to a life lived for the pursuit of the glory of God. And yet too often our actions in our home end up destroying the very thing that we should be trying to create. It ends up destroying our influence because, because sometimes those closest to us see us like we actually are sometimes when, when we can't put on the pretty face to come to church. And we've got to make it last for more than an hour while we sit in church. We've got to, we've got to do it 24-7. And then the real us begins to show up. There's a lot of brokenness in our homes and our families today. 
Sometimes we use the term broken home to refer to homes where divorce has taken place. And you have a, a mother and a father, a husband, a wife who no longer can tolerate living, each, living with each other for one reason or another. And so they, they go their separate ways and, and that home is broken. And then that's the way we normally ter- use the term, right? But do you know that the brokenness in our families, the brokenness in our homes starts long before you ever get to divorce? In fact, the brokenness in our homes and our families that can exist even if we never get to divorce. You see, the seeds of brokenness in the families are sown long before we even have a family. That starts early in life, and and the evidences of brokenness begin to show up. And and sometimes we just expect it, right? What are evidences of brokenness in our homes? What are some of the evidence of brokenness in our families? No, we we can go for the easy ones, like, like disobedience, right? When our children disobey us we recognize that as brokenness there's a there's a lack of of peace there's a lack of compliance with the things that they're supposed to do now we've just accepted that but there's reality that's broken why is that broken the answer is because God has commanded children to live in obedience to their parents that's wholeness when children obey that's wholeness when children disobey that's that's brokenness that can be anywhere from just minor disobedience to outright defiance. They're both broken. It just looks a little different, doesn't it? We we can have homes that are filled with anger. That's brokenness. God has commanded us to live in peace with one another. And, And when that sinful anger breaks out, we're breaking our families. It it can look like shouting. Or I suppose I should say sound like shouting. But shouting looks a certain way, doesn't it? Because you can see the anger on the face. You can see the frustration. You can, you can feel it. There's, there's no peace. It, it might be verbal fights and, and name-calling. It might be physical fights. It might be sibling wars or sibling rivalries. And, and we recognize all those things as brokenness. It, it, it can be different than that. Brokenness in our families can be as simple as the silent treatment. I just don't want to talk to anybody right now. Withdrawal, pulling away. Some of you in your family relationships, you have felt that brokenness where you can live in a house with with five other people and you feel so totally alone because of of silence. That's That's a breaking of the family. Sometimes children, they get upset. They just want to go hide in their rooms or go hide in the basement or just go out and get away from everything. That's an evidence of brokenness. The relationships are being torn apart. Sometimes a brokenness in our families can, can be a lack of respect for others. The people we live with, we treat them like dirt. And, and we can be all nice and friendly to other people outside the home, but, but when it comes to those closest to us, those whose hearts we hold in our hands, we can break them apart and squeeze them until there's no life left in them. And and that's brokenness. That's brokenness. Sometimes brokenness can be be some ways that that maybe we haven't thought of it before. Sometimes brokenness can be be the rush, the rushing through life, the the overscheduling of things that, that, that has revealed a set of priorities about what's important to us. And that can begin to break apart the family relationships and tear apart the core of of the central unit that God has built our world on, the family unit. This morning, I want to talk about how the gospel meets the brokenness in our families. And, And that might be big brokenness. That might be little brokenness, but it's brokenness. Now, some of you this morning say, well, I'm, I'm way past that. I, I'm done raising my kids. In fact, my kids are done raising their kids. We're all the way up to great-grandchildren. And, and I want to assure you this morning that I think I can show you from Scripture that you're not done yet. If you're a grandparent here this morning, or a great-grandparent, or however far you happen to get through life, you are not finished with restoring broken families. You have a part to play. Some of you this morning, you're in the midst of it right now. You're feeling that brokenness every day. And, and what I want to do is hopefully kind of, kind of give us a scriptural picture of what it looks like. 
Now, now one of the fears of, of, of preaching a message like this, I'll be honest with you, is the fact that my knowledge of parenting has, has really decreased over the years. I used to know a whole lot about parenting. And about 12 years ago, that all changed for me. And, and so what I'm asking you to do this morning is, is not listen to me as much as you listen to the Word. All right, I, w- I want you to hear what God says. We try to, try to explain it in a way that, that shows that, that we are people who, as broken people, we are living with broken people and are trying to put the principles of God's Word to work as we live the life God's called us to live. Some of you are on the front end. You haven't had children yet. And, and you're looking at one day. Listen, don't put it off because, because the seeds of brokenness in your family are, are sown long before that child appears in the world. It starts way earlier than that. And I want us this morning together to listen to the Word of God, to listen to what God says about families. And, and maybe you're here this morning, I understand that, that at times there are those who, who might feel the pain of their families, and what I say this morning is just going to scratch that, that scab, just kind of pick that scab off and make it hurt. And I don't want to do that this morning. But I hope that you understand that in a congregation like this, we have people from all walks of life. And families are something God has spoken to. And, and families are therefore something we need to speak to. Let me begin with this this morning. The gospel meets broken families by teaching people how to be married. The gospel meets broken families by teaching people how to be married. Let's go all the way back to the beginning. When God created the world, what did he create? Everything in it. And very soon in that creation, God said, it is not good that man should be alone. So he created male and female, the image of God. He created them both. He brought them together in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, and formed a home, formed a family. They both would have left their parents, but for this reason, man shall leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined together, and they shall become one flesh. They were supposed to have a unity and a purpose of life together. And the first command that God gave them was to multiply and fill the earth. They were to have children. And then they were to raise those children. Here, here, here's one of the odd things people say sometimes. We're, we're going to start a family. Or, or perhaps you've been on the awkward end of that question, maybe as a, as a newlywed. Somebody comes up and you say, when are you going to start a family? What's the answer to that? We already did. The family starts at marriage. When you leave your mother and father, and and, and he leaves or she leaves his or her mother or father, and you come together, at that point you have formed a family. You see, a family doesn't depend on kids. You can be a family without ever having children. Family is defined by a marriage where two people leave their father and mother and cleave to each other and become one flesh. Children add to the family. They don't create it. Marriage creates the family. Now, that family is the context in which children are raised. God ordained that children be raised in a home with a mother and a father who both participate in the raising of children. That was God's plan. It's not mom's job to raise the kids while while dad goes off to work. It's not dad's job to raise the kids while mom goes off to work or does whatever she does. All right? Both are to be involved in the raising of children. Now, it's the normal course of life that people get married and have children. The reality is, in a broken world, sometimes we get that out of order, don't we? Sometimes people have children and then get married, and, and it's reality, and it creates some difficulties. The good news is there's a grace for that. The good news is those children are still made in the image of God. And we still have a tremendous responsibility. So sometimes there is, in God's providence, there are couples who aren't able to have children, and, and for that there is grace. But ordinarily, God has ordained that families have children and raise them together for His glory. The prophet Malachi, writing about 400 years before the time of Christ, talks about marriage as, the, as for which one purpose is the raising of godly offspring. That was one of the reasons that God created marriage. It's not the only reason, but one of them is to raise a godly offspring. As the Apostle Paul put it in our passage this morning, children are to be raised in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. You see, it's God's plan for a mother and a father to come together and raise children for the glory of God. Now, we live in a broken world, and in that broken world, the ideal is not always the actual. 
I understand that this morning. The reality is that there are homes that are broken by divorce, by death, by abandonment, by internal struggle and internal turmoil. And if you're in one of those situations this morning, my heart goes out to you. We as a church, we want to come alongside you and support you and help you through that. My goal this morning is not to cause you additional pain. And I realize, as I said already, I realize this morning that for some of you, you are beginning to check out because you think, this is not me. And I ask you, for the sake of the authority of God's Word, to listen this morning. Ask yourself what your part might be in influencing other people's children, perhaps. Because families matter. A growing marriage is important to the foundation of families who are being made whole. A growing marriage. A growing marriage is one where the gospel is being lived out daily. It's a place where children can see and can learn what it means to follow Christ. And so, so at the foundation of stemming the brokenness in the home is as parents making sure that your marriage is growing and make sure that your marriage is being guarded. Now, I preached on that two weeks ago, and I'm not going to go back and, and re-preach that this morning. It's available online for those of you who missed it. But here's why it's important, because, because your children are watching you be married. Your children are watching you be married. And, and when they watch you, you know what they're doing. They're learning how to be married. Now, now you might think, well, they're only four or five or, or ten or twelve, but they're learning already. They're learning how to talk. You ever had that awkward moment when you hear your voice coming out of your kid's mouth? And you want to turn around and say, stop that. So you do. And they say, but, but that's, that's what you said. Well, yeah, I'm the dad. I get to say that. No, you don't. You see, they're learning all the time. They're watching the things we do. And, and when you are growing in your marriage, it's indicative that you are following Christ. Jesus has called us to live a certain way in our marriage. And disciples follow Jesus. When you're growing in Christ, you will be growing in your marriage. Maybe not every day. You'll have setbacks. You'll have some struggles. But you will be growing. And when you grow in your marriage, you are setting up yourself to show your children what it means to follow Christ, to live under the authority of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You'll be making disciples of them. Remember, the point of parenting is to make disciples, and it will be your most common place of making disciples, and it will be your most fruitful place of disciple-making. You will make disciples of your children. The only question is, what will you make them disciples of? What will you teach them? I raised this question in my mind this week as I was thinking about this. Will our homes ever be better than our marriage? I'll be honest with you, I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that question is. There's a part of me that says no. There's a part of me that says, I'm not sure, but I think if I am not growing as a spouse, how can I expect my home to be better than what I'm doing? How can I expect my home to be a place of increasing peace and godliness and holiness and humility if I'm not doing that? Now, anytime you put sinful people together, you're going to have problems. You start with two in marriage, that creates enough problems. You add three or four or five, and all of a sudden, you've got, you got all kinds of problems. But the foundation of stemming the brokenness in family starts with you as a spouse following Jesus together with your spouse. Remember two weeks ago, I described marriage as a co-pilgrimage. We're just two people walking together after Christ. And that's what marriage is, just walking together after Christ. And when the children start coming, you know what we do? We grab them by the hand and say, you're coming with us. We're going to follow Christ together. The foundation of stemming brokenness in your homes and in our families is going to be a commitment to follow Christ with a marriage that is growing in the gospel. And when I understand that I'm a sinner far beyond any hope, I'm a sinner who has done incredibly sinful things and, and, and sinned against the holy God who created me, I understand that Jesus came and died for that. And by faith, I can have the forgiveness and eternal life. That starts to change me from the inside. It should. 
And when I start living out that forgiveness and living out that grace of the gospel, it provides the foundation on which families can be made whole. It provides a foundation on which families can be built into small images of God's kingdom on earth, where people live in holiness and kindness and grace towards others. The gospel teaches us how to be married, and that provides the foundation for how we live in a family. But the gospel doesn't just address us in our marriage. The gospel addresses us in our children. Listen to Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. God says of Abraham, I have chosen him so that he may command his children and household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. God says, I've chosen Abraham so that he may command his children to follow the Lord. See, that's the job of a parent, right? We're not... We're not you know, fund directors. We're not activity coordinators. We're not taxis. Feels like it sometimes, right? We're not, we're not just trying to, to, to raise little servants in the house who can do all the work we don't want to do anymore. Though, though I confess I'm not upset that my son is old enough to mow the lawn. I'm glad about that. All right? but, but that's not our purpose in life. Our purpose in life as parents is to raise children who keep the way of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 6, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's our job. That's our job. Starts all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Turn back there if you would. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Remember, the book of Deuteronomy is given as Moses' last words just before the children of Israel are getting ready to cross into the promised land. And Moses is rehearsing for them in the book of Deuteronomy the last 40 years of your wilderness wondering how God delivered you from Egypt, and then you sinned against him. You didn't trust him, and he said, you're going to go live 40 years in the wilderness. And in all those 40 years in the wilderness, he reminds him, I have provided everything you need. I have never left you hungry. I've never left you without water. I've never left you with what, with, without something you need. And then he comes to chapter 6 says this, verse number one, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you so that you might do them in the land where you're going over to possess it so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all the statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life. Notice what he's saying. This is what you're going to do when you get there so that you your son and your grandson can fear the Lord your God and keep his commandments. Oh, Israel, listen, verse 3, and be careful to do it so that it may be well with you. And you may multiply greatly just as the Lord your God of your fathers has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. You see, going into the promised land, how was Israel going to continue to follow God? It was going to be passed down from father to son to son. And then you just keep repeating that for generations. Hear, O Israel, verse number 4, The Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your, all your might. And some of you remember Jesus saying that. And, and you didn't have any idea that Jesus didn't originate that during his life on earth. That's actually an Old Testament thing. You shall love the Lord your God. This is the first and greatest commandment. Love God with everything you are. These words, verse number 6, which I'm commanding you shall be on your heart. And that's not some kind of emotional kind of experience. He's saying have them on your mind all the time. Meditate on it. Live by it. Do it. Verse number 7, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. Just front and center everywhere you go. Everything you do is to be permeated with keeping the law of God. And you need to teach it diligently to your children. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. You see, here, here's the reality. As parents, our job is to teach. Now, as parents, we are always teaching. Maybe not intentionally, 
but we're doing it. God was telling Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you need to be intentional about teaching them diligently to follow God. But notice what happens before you teach it to your children. What needs to happen? Look at verse number 7. Verse number 6, I'm sorry. Before you teach them, what has to happen? They have to be on your heart. You you know why uh, maybe many of us don't faithfully teach the Scriptures to our children? It's because... It's not actually on our hearts. We haven't internalized it yet. We haven't embraced it yet. And therefore, we don't teach it consistently to our children. Here's the image I like to think of, and it's not original with me, so so if you uh, see it someplace else, that's probably where I got it from. Some of you like tea, right? And, and, And you take that tea bag and you put it in hot water, and what comes out of it? Tea, right? Why does tea come out of a tea bag? Because that's what's in the tea bag. Right? Now think about that in our lives. What is in our hearts is going to come out. What's in our hearts is going to come out. And when we get in hot water, it's really going to come out. And that's why God was telling His people, listen, these commandments need to be on your heart. And out of your heart, you then begin to diligently teach them. Look down, if you would, at verse number 20. When your son asks you in time to come, saying, What do the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments mean which the Lord our God commanded us? Then you shall say to your son, Go ask the preacher. Wait, I I didn't read that right, did I? What do you say to your son? We were slaves in Egypt. The Lord brought us forth with a mighty hand. The Lord showed great distressing signs and wonders before our eyes against Egypt, Pharaoh and his household. He brought us out from there in order to bring us in to give us the land which he had sworn to our fathers. So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as is today. And it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe this commandment before the Lord our God just as he commanded us. Think about what he's saying. Whose job is it to teach your children the ways of God? It's your job. It's your job. It's not the school's job. It's not the church's job. Listen, we are going to teach your children the Word of God, if you have them here. If you don't have them here, we can't teach them. So have them here. But the primary fundamental teacher of the truth of God to children is supposed to be the parents. Teach your children. And when they come and say, Dad, why this? Or Dad, why that? What do you say to them? You teach them the Word because you have already internalized it. You already know it. Some of you today, your child comes to ask you a question. You can't answer it. You know why? Because you haven't learned it yet. Or maybe you know the right words to say, but there's a part of you that you've been holding back and you're not quite sure you're fully committed to it yet. And you tell your child, yeah, you need to do this, but inside you kind of feel like a hypocrite because you know you're not fully committed to it. That's why you have to have them on your heart. And then out of that you teach them. And when your child comes to you and says, Dad, why? You can say, this is why. Now, he is not saying here, don't ever ask for spiritual teaching from somebody else. If your child comes and asks you something you don't know the answer to, what should you do? Go find an answer for them. Don't just make it up. That's always dangerous. But go find it. Ask somebody who might know. Teach yourself so that then you can teach them. We have to be able to teach our children what is already internal to us. And therefore, we have to learn it. The passage we read this morning in Ephesians chapter 6. In fact, turn over there now, if you would. And let's look at that one. Ephesians chapter 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Let me, let me back up here one second. You have these, what we call, epistles in the New Testament. It starts with the book of Romans. 
Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude. All those are called epistles. It's just a fancy word for letters, all right? And, And what they are is letters that were written to churches. Let me ask you something. What was the church supposed to do with the letter? They were supposed to read it publicly. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that. Colossians chapter 4, that when, he writes to Paul, when Paul writes to the church of Colossae, he says, read this letter to your church, and then you read the letter from the church at Laodicea and have them read your letter. Now, now let me ask you a question. Why is it that Paul addresses children here? He addresses them in, in, in terms of grammar. This is what we call, I think, a vocative. It's their name. Children, obey your parents. Why does he address them in a letter that is to be read publicly in church? The answer is because they are there. He's not telling the church, he's not not telling parents, parents make your children obey. No, he's addressing the children because there's the presumption that they are part of the church. They are part of the assembly. Now, here at Evangel, we have our children separated. We have them in their own classes. And by the way, uh, you don't have to use those classes. If, if, if We have great teachers. I love our children's staff here. I, I, I love the people that are there. And, and they, do a, they do a tremendous job with our, with our children's ministry. But here at Evangel, the goal of our children's ministry is not to have something completely different than what we do here. The goal of our children's ministry is to do there, and I point there because I think that's where it is, right, that way, to do there what we do here, so that it's largely the same. See, what do we do here? Well, in in this room on our Sunday mornings in our worship services, we do uh, four basic things added with a fifth. I say it this way, we sing, preach, pray, give, and go. Now, why do we sing, preach, pray, give, and go? And the answer is because that's what God told us to do in His Word, sing, Preach, teach the word, pray together, give an offering, and then go out into your life to live out what you've learned. Sing, preach, pray, give, and go. You know what we want to do in our children's ministry? We want to sing, preach, pray, give, and go. Now, we're going to do it on a little bit of a different level because of their intellectual capabilities, okay? We're going to do it probably a little bit of a different level because of their attention spans, Uh, they they might not be able to to, to listen as long as, as I'm asking you to listen, whether or not you know, you're with me all the time, I understand that. But, but we do it on a little bit different level. But what we want to do over there is essentially what we do here. Oftentimes, we, we have so separated children from the idea of the church that, that when they finally get to the age where they come in here, they have no idea what's going on because they've never seen it before. And part of discipleship is we want to start that early. We want to sing, preach, pray, give, and go for them just like we do for us. Children, obey your parents and the Lord. Oftentimes, it seems like we have this mandate backwards. Children are not to to obey. Children are to be obeyed. Children have a way of demanding our attention and demanding sometimes our obedience, don't they? Their whininess, their temper tantrums, they lay on the floor and demand that they be obeyed. Or so, sometimes their, their silent temper tantrums can be just as much a temper tantrum as the loud ones can be. What are they trying to do? They're trying to force us to obey them. And, and, and sometimes we, we actually give in to that because, let's be honest, sometimes we just want to maintain the peace, right? We're just tired of dealing with it. We just want to be quiet. We want them to be quiet. And so we're going to... We're gonna, now, 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 here's my, my, my issue in that is just to challenge us to think carefully about how we relate to that, okay? Because here's the mandate God has given that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, to, to do the things because their obedience to parents is obedience to God. Parents are God-given authority, and and when we say obey in the Lord, their obedience is not merely to us. We are the God-given authority, and their obedience to us is obedience to God. And so we need to teach them, God has placed me in your life to be the authority in your life for good. When you obey me, 
You are obeying God. Now, if you're asking them to obey you, make sure you're asking them to do something that is biblical. Don't ask them to sin against God. Don't force them to to be put in a position where they have to obey God or obey you. But the idea is that God has given children to us, and we are to be the God-given authority. He says, this is right. This is the way it's supposed to be. It's not just to make the home run smoother or more peaceful. It's the right thing to do. That word right there, you know what it is? It is the word that is used to describe God. It is righteous. It is correct. It is the way God created the world. Children are not just to obey. Children are to honor He quotes here the fifth commandment, verse number two, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. That this was the first commandment that was explicitly attached to the promise of inheriting the land. Now remember in the Old Testament, just kind of set set our memory just for a moment, God had promised them, I will lead you into land and you will dwell in that land. And the very first commandment that is attached directly to that promise is the promise to honor your father and mother. That's why it's a first commandment of life, so that it may dwell, so it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth or live long in the land. Now, here's what God is not promising. God is not promising your children that if they obey you, they will live to be 90 or 100 years old. If they disobey you, there's a really high chance that lifespan is going to be shortened. At least we feel that way sometimes, don't we? But that's not the promise. The promise was Israel. God said, if you raise your children to obey me, you know what will happen? You will live in peace in the land of Palestine because that's what I promised you. But if you do not raise your children to obey me, they're going to get kicked out of the land. That's Deuteronomy 28, 29, 30. If you obey me, you will live there in peace and prosperity. And if you disobey me, you will have war and enemies and ultimately you will be kicked out of it. You see, the fathers were to teach the children to follow God. Honor your father and mother so that it may be well with you. It was the blessing of God. And by putting this here, God is showing us the importance that he places on obedience. Children need to know that life gets better when they obey. And it gets worse when they disobey. And part of our job is to make sure that happens. You ready for this? Part of our job as parents is to make their life worse when they disobey. They need to feel the consequences of it. It's a part of teaching and training. When their lives do not get worse for disobedience, we are bypassing the curse that God instituted for sin. Again, put it in the context of all of Scripture. God said, if you disobey me, there's going to be consequences. And that happened to be death. One of our temptations as parents, and I understand this, one of our temptations as parents is to try to bail kids out of the consequences of their sin. Well, it's only one time. Well, I don't feel like dealing with it now. And when we do that, we are bypassing the curse. And we need to be careful about that. Because the way we handle disobedience is, is sending a message about God and His world. You see, there are choices and consequences, and we need to make sure our children understand that. Now, now here's the hard part. It's not always easy easy to know how to bring those consequences or what exactly those consequences should be. We're probably, we we can probably establish this morning that, that, that oversleeping by two or three minutes after we told them to get up is probably not cause to be grounded for the rest of the summer. You're going to get tired of that long before they will, Right? Sometimes we're not sure exactly how severe to make the punishment. But we need to think carefully about the message we're sending about the way God created the world. It's important for them to know that choices have consequences. There are children who grow up who are surprised to find out that there are consequences for the things they do because they were never taught. We need to make sure that we are living and leading our children to live in the world God has created, both in terms of consequences, but also in terms of grace. That in those punishments for sin, there's also grace that needs to be demonstrated because the gospel matters to our children just as much as it matters to us. 
My encouragement to you this morning is when you think about raising your children and and bringing discipline into their lives to teach them how to follow Jesus, that we wrestle very carefully with the role of consequences and punishment for disobedience. Let's continue on this thought with verse number four. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let me start with that word fathers because half of you just thought, (laughs) I'm off the hook. Or, or maybe half of you say, well, what about me? And, and the answer is, is that fathers includes mothers. It refers to authority that God has placed in life. You go all the way back to the beginning. It took a male and a female, a mother and a father to have children. There was one virgin birth in history, and there's not going to be another one. Everyone else takes two, right? And, and both father and mother are required to multiply and fill the earth. And both father and mother were instituted as an authority. That's why the Ten Commandments says, honor your father and mother, side by side, equal. Listen, mothers are not lesser roles in the raising of children. And by the way, fathers, you must not be a lesser role in the raising of children. It's mother and father. We see this also in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs constantly talks about the way that we raise our children, the way we bring them out. I want to show you a verse on the screen this morning. If you look up there, I want to show you how this works. This is Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 20. The, pro, the, the Bible says, My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Now, I've, I've arranged it up there in a particular way because I want you to see it. Sometimes the way the Proverbs teach us is by what we call parallelism. It'll have two lines that say the same thing. Notice what it is. Observe the commandment is the same thing as do not forsake the teaching, right? And your father is parallel to your mother. You know what Solomon was doing? Solomon was putting fathers and mothers on the same plane when it comes to raising children. He was putting them on the same plane. So when the Bible in Ephesians chapter 6 talks about fathers, do not provoke your children in anger, but raise them in discipline and instruction of the Lord, he's talking to parents. Now, what does he mean when he says don't provoke them to anger? It is possible for us as parents to discipline our children, to have expectations of our children that, that in the words of Colossians chapter 3, verse 21, exasperate them and cause them to lose heart. We can raise Ill, unrealistic expectations. I remember a couple of years ago, my son was playing baseball, and, and, and he was pitching, and, and this lady, I don't even know who she was, uh, was standing behind the backstop beside me yelling at him, just throw strikes, throw strikes, throw strikes. And I'm thinking, well, oh, he, he never thought of that before. And so he comes off the field, I was standing behind him, he comes over to me after that, and he was over, it's like, why was she yelling at me? I want to say, because she's an idiot. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. Listen, he was getting frustrated by that. You've probably done the same thing to your children. I know I have. That's very easy to provoke them to anger by the way we just, maybe it's unrealistic expectations, maybe it's petty or minor requirements, maybe it's our own response of anger, maybe it's, it's just disinterest, maybe it's our inconsistency. But what God has called us to do is not provoke them to anger, but raise them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Teach them the ways of God in the world. Teach them the ways of, of Scripture discipline them and instruct them in the ways of God. This is done all throughout life. It involves instructing their hearts as well as their behavior. Our, our goal for them is not simply unthinking obedience. We, we all like the words, because I said so. Right? And, and there's a place in life where because I said so should be enough. But it's not enough for long. Because we don't want to create just raw, unthinking obedience. We want to teach them to think about the world the way God has created it. We want to teach them a worldview that shows that God's authority is what we must listen to. Because I said so, we'll probably never convince them of that. But by pointing them to the Scriptures 
And and every day throughout the milieu of life, we can show them what it means to apply the Scriptures. If we think back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 for a moment, have these words and teach them, and and, and teach them when you're sitting down, and and when you rise up, and when you're lying, when you're walking around, and, and I ask you, what else do you do? That is everything in life. See, everything we do in life, we are constantly to be teaching them the Word of God. How's that going to happen? When it's on our hearts, where's it go? It just starts coming out. When it's on our hearts, it keeps coming out. Why doesn't it come out of us as parents? Often because it's not in there yet. Or because we have conflicting ideas. Because we're not living in full submission to God's Word. When it's in there, it comes out. And everything we do becomes a place for teaching. The family, as we teach, we teach them the reality of sin its effects, and its consequences. If we never punish children for their sinful disobedience, we are not teaching them the biblical doctrine of sin. We are not teaching the biblical doctrine of God's holiness. We teach them the reality of sin, but, but we also teach them the grace of the gospel that forgives and transforms. You know, the family itself teaches the reality of grace. Because a child being a part of a family doesn't change because they sinned against the family in some way. They're still part of our family even when they sin. We don't kick them out. They're still part of us. And that's the gospel of the grace of God. See, Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 is not an event. It's a lifestyle. It's always going on. You are never not teaching. You are always teaching. So we need to raise them to be self-sufficient adults who follow God as disciples because they've seen his glory. And we're going to do that by praying for them and praying with them. And I just want to tell you, I beg you, dads, do not leave the praying to somebody else. When you go put your kids in bed at night, stop and pray with them. Let them hear you pray. Don't leave it to somebody else. That's not to say that mom's prayers are bad. Moms, when you put your kids in bed at night, go pray with them. Let them hear you. Read read the Bible with them. Read the Bible to them. You can begin with Bible story books for younger ones, but then move on to the actual Bible itself. And you read it and they read it and share that around. Talk the Bible all through daily life. Wherever you are, look for ways to bring the Scripture and God into it. Live the Bible. Show it by your life. Show it by your priorities. Show it by the choices you make. Show that God matters. You see, hypocrisy is not an excuse, but it is a problem. When they say, yeah, but you did it, well, that's not an excuse for them, but it is a problem for us. Do as I say, not as I do, is not a good parenting technique. They're always learning from us. Think about the power of example. You are teaching constantly how to respond to life. As we raise children in discipline and instruction of the Lord, we have to take that seriously. Both teaching on sin and its consequences and on grace and the gospel. Bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Tie it to Scripture. Look on your screen up above at Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Give heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. Do not forget the things which your eyes have seen so that they do not depart from your heart all the days of your life, but make them known to your sons and your grandsons. Remember I told you earlier, you're you're not off the hook just because your kids are out of the house. One of the greatest contributions that you can make as you grow through the senior years of life is making known to your grandchildren the glory and the grace of God. You have lived it longer than your children have, obviously. 
and you have so much that you could pour into them. Listen to Exodus chapter 10. Go to, the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh. I have a heart in his heart and the heart of his servants that I may perform these signs of mine among you that you may tell it in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians. Pass it down from generation to generation. I, I quoted already this morning, Psalm 145 verse 4. One generation shall praise your works to another. Hey, Grandma, your kids need to hear you talk about Jesus. Grandpa, your kids need to hear you talk about Jesus. Psalm 78 talks about the works of God. And he established this law so that they should teach them to your children that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born. Think about that for a moment. What's he saying? You're teaching your children so that in the days to come, the children that they will have that are not even yet born, they will benefit because you taught, your kids will teach because of what you told them. In other words, there's generations that have not yet come about yet who will hear the glory of God because you taught your sons and your grandsons. Parent, you're not just raising children. You're teaching your children how to raise children. How many of you right now, you can think of something your mother or father did, and you say, I'm never doing that to my kids. You might have changed your mind on that once you became a parent. <laughs> Wait, that's pretty good. Locking them in their room for 12 hours, that, that's, that's, <laughs> turn the radio up real loud so you can't hear him. But we understand we're teaching we're teaching how to. And I want to tell you, grandparents, you have tremendous influence over your grandchildren. Frankly, too much sometimes because you spoil them. You let them have things their parents would never let them have. My kids said, my grandpa let me do this. Oh, your grandpa never let me do that. <laughs> I wish I'd been my parents' grandchild. I think my life would have been better. <laughs> they watch these, so I'm sorry, Mom. But I want to tell you, grandparents, you have time to speak in their lives. You have experiences that you can pass on to them. You can tell them about generations of how God has been faithful to you. You can tell them about the life you lived and the struggles you have, and you can encourage them in the things, things, of, the God, things of God and His Word. But you've got to do it. You've got to do it. So here's what I tell you this morning. Know the Bible increasingly deeply. It's got to be on your heart. It's got to be internalized. Men, you need to know your Bible. It's not somebody else's job to know your Bible. It's yours. It's not somebody else's job to teach your kids the things of God's Word. It's your job. Now, be a part of the church where the where, where the Bible's being taught. And I don't mind a bit if you take my lessons and my teachings and, and you go home and teach them to your children. You might do a better job than I will. You might do it shorter, but you will do it because it's your job. Moms, know your Bible. Teach it to your children. Learn to sprinkle it in throughout the day. So, so don't just know the Bible deeply. Speak the Bible regularly. Learn to ask the questions. What do you think God says about that? Or, or, or learn to, to know the Proverbs so that you can quote them and read them and teach them. All throughout life, you're sprinkling in God and His Word. Model the Bible daily. Every day of your life, you're teaching your kids what to think about the Bible. You're teaching your grandchildren what to think about the Bible. You're teaching them about priorities. And, and so set your priorities carefully. And at the end, to sum it all up, give them a great big picture of the glory of God through the Word of God. That's what it's to be about. At the end of the day, when, when, when our children grow up and move out and, and start their own families by getting married and, and then grow those families by having children, what do we want for them? The answer should be, I want them to have a great big picture of the glory of God that they saw every day being lived out in the home. Listen, we're not going to be perfect parents, but we can be godly parents. We're not going to be perfect grandparents, but we can be godly grandparents. We can know the Bible and communicate it. 
we can have lives that are being used of God to raise up the next generation. One day we're all going to be dead and gone. But I'm reminded again of what God said to Abraham. I have chosen him so that he may command his children after them to walk in the ways of God. That's our job. That's how we stem the brokenness. And when our children are raised for the glory of God, you know what they do? They go live the glory of God and pass it on to their grandchildren by God's grace and by God's help and with the authority of God's word, let us commit ourselves to finding hope in the brokenness of our families by living with the word of God permeating every area of our life and pass that on to those around us. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes this morning as we pray. Father, you've given us families and children, and they are a heritage from you. They are a gift that you have given us, and it's one that we must steward wisely. In the children's class this morning, there are children who desperately need to see mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles in whom the word has taken root and is being lived out daily. And so, Father, calls us to embrace your word, calls us to embrace the authority of your word, the grace that's found in it, the instruction for life, so that we can rear a generation of people who see the great glory of God in the word and follow it because they've seen it in us. May we live faithfully for your glory and be a model of what it means to love and to follow Jesus on this earth. Protect our families from those things which would destroy us. Protect those families from those things which would break us apart. Strengthen the marriages so that they will last as a testimony of God's grace. Strengthen our relationships with our children so they can find the grace of God through the word as we live it and teach it to them. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. As we close this morning, we're going to sing a song, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. As we sing this this morning, I hope this is the prayer of your heart. It's so easy for us to start living for other things, but at the end of the day, our children need to see somebody whose life is consumed with the glory of God, whose life is consumed with the Word of God and is willing to live it every day. Stand together with me as we sing this morning this closing song of consecration, Take My Life and Let It Be